So this is called Good Ride Number Nine, Bernice. Last chance, Colorado. May have been the first chance I've had to be happy naked in public. But wait a minute, that's the chapter before. I'm going to start a little later. <laughs> You'll have to read that to see when I'm naked in public. The, the sun is coming up, and there's no such thing as rush hour traffic in this part of the country. But yet again, the very first car that approaches pulls over. The problem is, how do I get in? The entire vehicle, a beat-up yellow 80s Chevy Citation, is completely filled with books, every kind imaginable, hardbacks, trade paperbacks, uh, but especially mass market editions, some missing their covers. The passenger seat is piled so high I can't even see who's behind the wheel. Slowly, like a jigsaw puzzle being assembled in reverse, I see a face as she throws the book in the back under the seats, even in her lap. Sorry, the rather haggard looking woman in her late 60s with the weakest chin I've ever seen in my life. I like to read. I see that, I answer good naturedly as I jump in, pick books off my seat, and then pile them in my lap. I like to read too, I say, taking a gander at the eye popping cover art of the vintage sex paperback Teen Girls Who Are Assaulted by Animals. This one is amazing, I say, We're wondering what the editorial meeting at the publisher could have been like to green light this paper. Here's a niche audience I hadn't imagined. All books are amazing, she corrects me with a passion. Are you a librarian, I ask cheerfully, knowing after being the keynote speaker for several of their conferences how wild librarians can be. <laughs> Not officially, she answers with a practice bravery. I was, she confides, and then something happened, and I wasn't. <laughs> oh, I'm John, I introduce myself, trying to change the subject away from her obviously painful past. They call me Bernice, she answers about fanfare, and I read your last book. I love the chapter, Bookworm, but you're too literarily correct for my taste. <laughs> Before I can stick up for my published reading recommendations, she suddenly breaks for a car that swerves around some tire rubble in the highway, and a huge pile of cheap paperbacks stacked pack rat style in the back seat collapses on top of me. I pick off saddle shoe sex kit. <laughs> some like it hard. <laughs> and freak out on Sunset Strip with the amazingly politically incorrect subtitle Fag, Streaks, and My Famous Turn the Street into a Hippie Hell. <laughs> They're not for me, she explains, as she pulls off I-70 onto a rural road. They're for my book club readers. <laughs> Before I can protest that I can't go off the interstate, she tells me, don't worry, I'll take you back to the highway. We cut back to an even less traveled country road, turn the corner and see a tobacco road-style hut constructed entirely out of paperback books missing their front cover. <laughs> the owner has shellacked the books to make them semi-weatherproof, but the elements have been not been kind. The volumes, so many times through from rain, are swollen, tattered, and can't offer much in the way of protection. Publishers don't want cheaper, cheap paperback books returned when they don't sell, Bernice explains. The newsstand manager is supposed to rip off the covers and turn those in and get their refund. The retail outlets are expected to then just throw away the books. And I rescue them from this biblioclasm. <laughs> and, and redistribute the volumes to alternative readers at the lowest end of the, of the used book market. <laughs> I know it's hard to imagine, but a very few dedicated collectors only want books with torn off copies. It's these specialized readers I serve. I am not alone. Flea market vendors, paper recycling workers, relatives of deceased dirty book collectors, we are united in a mission to do what libraries cannot, bring the customer the lowest of the low in the literature. <laughs> Oh, there's Cash, she says, as a skinny, grubby, 48-year-old white guy with a pot belly and a Prince Valiant haircut comes out of his self-styled reading room. I quickly realize by Cash, she means her customer's name, not actual money. Her books are, of course, free. 
Cash is a very specific customer, she explains. His books must be soft core and pre-porn with a missing cover done by a collectible artist. He then actually reads these smutty volumes, writes endless critiques of the writer's style, which he never allows anyone else to read, and then uses the red book as a building block for another room in his shanty town abode. <laughs> Aberdeen says shouts cash in some sort of regional accent too obscure for me to identify. Hello, sir, she says with a literary grin. This is my friend John. Cash completely ignores me, so Bernice just goes into her routine. I got some good ones for you today, she promises as Cash's eyes light up and he licks his lip in anticipation. Here you go, she teases. She'll get hers by John Punkett. With a missing cover by Raphael de Soto, Cash yells, back with postmodern literary enthusiasm. I remember that one, Cash. Bernice reminisces like the true pro that she is. That was great bold art, pulp art, but it's gone now. Who wants to go to an art gallery? I want to read, yells Cash as he grabs the volume and hugs it to his chest with literary fetishism. How about this one, tempts Bernice, holding up a yellowing paperback with both the front and back binding ripped off. Remember the pulp jacket with the sexy lady on the couch clutching the pillow like her love is, she quizzes? Restless by Greg Hamilton, Cash shouts, back like he's on a quiz show with cover art by Paul Rader. And I'm glad the cover is gone. <laughs> I read these books, Bernice. I don't look at them. I read every word until I understand perfectly what the author was saying just to me, the last reader these volumes will ever have. <laughs> Bernice hands him the damaged volume and he grabs it with scary gratitude. See you next Thursday, Cash, Bernice promises. And with that, we're back in the car and off to the next outside reader. I'm no judge of what people read as long as they read, explains Bernice once we're on the road. Are all your books dirty ones, I ask, with great curatorial respect? <laughs> no, she answers proudly. I've got true crime, too. <laughs> A lot of libraries won't carry the really gruesome ones, just like bookstores. They discriminate, putting the true crime sections way in the back of the store, hidden near the gay section. <laughs> Before I can agree, she gives me a sudden look of traumatic desperation that stops me in my tracks. Believe me, she whispers sadly as we suddenly pull into the driveway of a suburban ranch home. I know about censorship. <laughs> Out comes Mrs. Adderley, a most unlikely matronly true crime reader, still dressed in her house coat. Hi, Bernice. I'm glad you're here. I got in a fight down at the library just yesterday. They take my taxes. Why can't I have a say in the books the library buys? <laughs> Hi, I'm John, I put in. I thought the library had to get you a book if you asked for it. Oh, they say you do, Mrs. Downey answers without missing a beat. But they lie. <laughs> I happen to be obsessed with wound raiders. Are you familiar with that genre? <laughs> She does point blank. You mean women who tell their husbands they're pregnant when they're not and then follow real pregnant ones, kill them, cut out their babies, and take them home claiming they're given birth? That's the one. Acknowledge with Bernice and Pat, I'm so well informed in this specialized field. <laughs> Well, I read Lullaby at Good Night by D.T. Hughes, Mrs. Adderley continues, but there's another one I want, Hush Little Baby by Jim Carrier, where the raider cuts out the baby with the mother's car keys and the baby actually lives. Well, this literary snob of a librarian says to me when I ask if she has that book, there's no need to know about something that ugly. Yes, there is, I yell in outrage, completely agreeing with Mrs. Adderley's anger. The public needs to know, I read, when you're pregnant, strangers are following your every step, ready to jump out and cut out your baby with your car keys. <laughs> Wound raiders are everywhere. <laughs> exactly agrees Mrs. Adderley, thrilled to have someone else in her corner. Bernice gets a sly grin on her face and whips out a mid-condition bound galley of this very title and hands it over. Oh, Bernice, Mrs. Adderley gushes, you know how to make a true crime buff happy. Thank you from the bottom of my black little heart. <laughs> We're off. I'm impressed. Bernice turns on the radio and we hear the delightful little country song Swinging Down the Lane by Jerry Wallace and merrily sing along, harmonizing over the instrumental bridge between verses. I continue picking through the books on the floor by my feet and laugh at one whole town spelled with an H. A hilariously titled softcore vintage gay stroke book. 
You want that one? She asked with generosity. Sure, I say, mentally adding this rare title to my collection of cheesy gay sex paperbacks. I would go right along with my chicken body inside each other. You mean titles with the word chicken in them? She asked, immediately understanding my uncle, Billy Attile, specialty. Yes, I've got Uncle's Little Chicken, Trickin' the Chicken, Chicken for the Harmat, even Chain Gang Chicken. <laughs> I know them well, she announces, with a good lack of respect. And you, Bernice, I gently cry, what kind of terrible books do you collect? She freezes, suddenly protective of her most private scholarly taste, but then seems eager to have someone to whom she can, she can confide. The novelization of porn parody movies, she admits to great pride. It's a small genre, but one that is growing and coursing. She explains her deep knowledge of her field. I tried to introduce the specialized volume to the general public when I was head librarian in my hometown of Eagle. But Colorado is such a backward state. <laughs> Trouble started as soon as I displayed splendor in the ads. <laughs> and home all alone. <laughs> With the covers out instead of spying in. Dizzy body little prudes noticed and made a big deal out of it. But I stood strong against censorship. Porn parody titles need to be discovered and celebrated. I was vilified in both the local and national press, but I didn't care. I fought back. I passed out valuable, extremely rare copies of Clitty Clitty Bang Bang <laughs> to any high school reader in the library who asked for it. Satire needs to be taught. These youngsters love Clitty, but I was fired. I called the Kids Right to Read and the National Coalition Against Censorship Organizations, but they wouldn't help me. I became a scapegoat for the humor impaired. Before I can offer my unbridled support, she pulls her car over to the 1 I-70 West ramp, and we are buried in sliding paperback books. With great concern and kindness, she asks gently, do you have the 12 inches series? <laughs> yes, I murmur in excitement, trying to stack Bernice's volumes back up in some kind of order. I've got 12 inches, 12 inches with a vengeance, and 12 inches around the world. <laughs> but do you have 12 inches in peril? She demands with excitement, ripping the title out from the glove compartment and holding it up like the Holy Grail. No, I shall with rapid delight, quivering in reverse literary excitement. <laughs> We look at each other in our love of disreputable books, and she hands it over, completing my collection. Thank you, Bernice, I say in heartfelt appreciating, caressing this title like a sexual partner. We must go now, John, she says with sudden concern. I can't be exposed. My readers will continue to hide me. They know. They know I'm the best damn alternative library in the country. You should be proud, Bernice, I say as I get out, bow in respect, and blow her a kiss goodbye. Run, she says with urgency. Run to weed. <laughs>